a very good sunny afternoon to all of you after a couple of days of rain. Uh, thank you for coming for this very interesting lecture today on complicated cosmopolitanism, Chinese encounters with colonial and post-colonial Calcutta to be delivered by Professor Tan Sin Sen, Director Center for Global Asia, New York University, Shanghai. And we shall have Mr. Hari Vasudevan sharing the event and uh, steering us through the Q&A session, Q session at the end of the presentation. So may I request Mr. Dr. Jayantha Shengupta, uh, Secretary Curator of Victoria Memorial Hall to kindly welcome the audience, after which we'll go into the lecture. Thank you, Raju, and uh, very good afternoon to all of you. And welcome to this new venue, our new conference hall, where we have just started scheduling some events. This is a new facility which we haven't formally inaugurated, uh, but we have used this opportunity to do programs for which we don't need to depend on the main museum building anymore, which, as you know, is under renovations. So the, the space is, is at a premium there. But we are fortunate to have this new conference facility. And so we welcome all of you to this and to this lecture today on complicated cosmopolitanism, Chinese encounters with colonial and post-colonial Calcutta by Professor Tan Shen Shen. It's a privilege and honor for us to have Professor Tan Shen Shen to speak here. Uh, he is the he is Professor of History and the Director of Center for Global Asia at New York University, Shanghai, and also glo Global Network Professor at New York University. And it's also an honor to have Professor Hari Vasudevan, uh, the Emeritus Professor of History at the University of Calcutta and Director of the China Center in the University of Calcutta, uh, my former teacher, to, to chair this uh, talk. So uh, that's all I have to say. Like all of you, I look forward to an exciting lecture and an exciting interaction with the audience at the end of this. So thank you very much for coming. Enjoy the lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jayanto. And before I hand over the microphone to Professor Tan Sen Sen, may I request all of you to kindly switch off your mobile phones or put them on silent mode, please. Professor Sen. Yeah, of course. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm certain that all of us are thankful to, to Jantar for arranging uh, this occasion. Um, the guest of the evening is, uh, is Professor Tan Sen Sen, who is, uh, who, uh, is actually a Calcuttan in many ways. Um, he's, uh, his uh, father uh, taught for years and years and years at Vishu Bharati. Um, he... His father used to teach at Calcutta University uh, once upon a time as well. Uh, Tan Sen has grown up between Delhi and, uh, and Calcutta before he made his, uh, his uh, great move both to China as well as to Pennsylvania and later to New York where uh, his Chinese studies were, uh, were constituted. I mean, he comes to us though uh, after a long and very rich career in which he really studied China in the world uh, over time, beginning very much at the beginning and uh, dealing with a good deal of ancient history as he went along. But over the course of the past 10 years, when I've come to know him really, very well, um, he's had, he's taken an enormous interest in this connection, the, both personal, social, uh, cultural, which exists between China and India. And uh, he's managed to tell us at different lectures, different things about it, and some of his uh, activities by way of actually reading the archives, reading different kinds of travelogues, etc., has been uh, published in this uh, extremely readable uh, and very nice book, which is available uh, quite easily in India, India, China, and the World, um, which came out uh, last year, um, and which really deals with all sorts of snippets of information as well as grand stories, which really bring the Chinese connection to our front doorstep here in Calcutta. We tend to, to forget it. We simply acknowledge its existence in the world around us. We never think beyond a certain point about it. Uh, the book as well as his lectures have 
frequently been able to, to bring uh, much that we don't know to the surface. And uh, it's a very good read, and I certainly recommend that you obtain it if you haven't already seen it and haven't already read it. Um, today, he's going to talk about some of these connections, some of the ways in which people from China travel to India, uh, and the way in which they kind of read Calcutta, and they read Bengal in many different ways. Uh, some of these figures may, may not be known to you, uh, but I won't uh, say anything more uh, other than what I've already said. As I said, he's a very distinguished professor, but he's a very accessible writer, a very accessible lecturer. Uh, so please enjoy this afternoon. Thank you, Harry, for those nice words, um, and John Duda for organizing this, and uh, thank you all for coming. I just have to manage two computers, so let me try to figure out how I'll do this. Um, uh, and uh, let's see. So um, as Harry was saying, uh, one of my interests uh, in the last uh, six, seven years uh, has been to look at uh, the connections between uh, Kolkata and uh, and China uh, in different ways. I started actually working uh, on the Chinese community here in Kolkata, uh, looking specifically at the West Bengal State Archives uh, in uh, Shekshwar Shorani, which has about 200 files, uh, intelligence bureau files on the Chinese community. Uh, and it's just a fascinating read. So every time I came to Kolkata, I just sat there uh, and went through the archival files. Um, it tells a different kind of story uh, that I knew about India-China connections. It's not about uh, necessarily political connections, but uh, connections among people who came um, looking for jobs, people who were smuggled into Kolkata from China, uh, people who were trading in different uh, commodities. Um, so it, it gave me a very different perspective uh, on, uh, on the connections that Kolkata had with uh, different parts of China. And I, I looked at other parts of uh, Bengal, especially Kalimpong and, and Kalimpong's connections uh, northwards towards uh, Lhasa. Uh, and and it, it made me uh, realize how important Kolkata was uh, for the Chinese. Um, and, and that's what I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, not our perspective on the Chinese or China, but the Chinese perspective uh, on Kolkata. Uh, there are other issues. Uh, there's actually a lot of material about, uh, for example, the translation of Bible uh, and, and other connections between China and, uh, and, and Kolkata. But I'll focus on the writings uh, of, of the Chinese and how um, uh, the Chinese looked at Kolkata in different phases. So let me just uh, look this up. Now, the, the title uh, uh, is, is inspired in, in some ways by uh, Parthoda's lecture a few weeks ago here, uh, where he was talking or asking if Kolkata was a colonial city. Uh, and then he mentioned briefly uh, the cosmopolitan nature of Kolkata. Uh, and the first example was the presence of Chinese here, uh, which made it uh, cosmopolitan in some ways. Yes, the presence of the Chinese in Kolkata is quite fascinating. Uh, they are perhaps the largest migrant groups from outside South Asia uh, in Kolkata. Uh, but it's a complicated issue about the Chinese. And one thing that I'm going to argue is not to lump everything under this title called Chinese uh, or China. It's more diversified. Uh, and, and so it's very important to understand uh, the different types of Chinese encounters with, with Kolkata. And, and that's what I'm going to go over. Uh, but Kolkata itself, uh, and I find this quite interesting. Uh, um, and let's see, OK, this is what I have to make sure that I'm changing the slides there as well. Um, is, uh, is China as a uh, Kolkata as a site of intra-Asian uh, interactions? I know there's a summer school going on uh, on intra-Asian interactions, and and it's quite fascinating to see how important Kolkata was uh, since, uh, let's say, 19th century from the Opium War, even before the Opium War in the 1840s. Um, it was clearly a place where opium was exported from. Um, it was where uh, many of the soldiers fighting wars in, in China, a um, number of different wars in China, the, the Opium War, the Boxer War, later on, 
went to China from the ports of Kolkata. Uh, Penang, Malacca, and Singapore uh, were ruled from, from Kolkata. There are a number of different foreign settlements. Armenians were here, uh, the Chinese were, of course, here. Uh, but there were other people who settled in Kolkata and, and promoted these kinds of connections to different parts uh, of Asia. Um, it was also a place of financial transactions, and I think very little has been done on this, uh, how people who uh, traded in different parts of parts of India came to Kolkata and then transferred money uh, out of Kolkata, and this is uh, late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, it is uh, very important for the Chinese who were unable to, to go to Lhasa from, from Sichuan or other places who would come to Kolkata and then walk uh, through Kalimpong into Lhasa, and that continued until 1952, where we find um, uh, important commodities being supplied to Tibet uh, through Kolkata, through Bengal. Um, but it's also a place where uh, many of the things from different parts of Asia are curated. Um, it's not only the, the Victoria Memorial, has, Asiatic Society has fascinating collection of things from different parts of Asia. Uh, the Indian Museum uh, also has very interesting things, and one of the projects we were trying to do is to catalog these artifacts that come from Southeast Asia and even from China. Um, and many of the Chinese and, and Southeast Asians don't know that we have these artifacts. Uh, this is also the place where the the Greater India Society was established and their writings uh, not only about Southeast Asia but extending to, to China, especially P.C. Bakshi's works, uh, are quite important. Uh, and, and so it's, it's a place where uh, study of, of Asia took place, study of intra-Asia took place before it became a very important topic. But also uh, Mahabodhi Society, which is something I looked into, was, was a site where it brought together people from different parts of Asia, Sri Lanka of course, but also Thailand, from China, Japan. They all met in Mahabodhi Society, and, and the records of the Mahabodhi Society and the Journal of Mahabodhi Society uh, has a fascinating records of these interactions uh, that took place in Kolkata. They also have a branch in Sarnath, but the Kolkata one was, was really very interesting with regard to how many different people uh, came together in this location, and this went on until 1949-1950. Now, I want to ask a very simple question here in this, in this talk uh, about the, the Chinese. So one of the things I noticed when I was reading various books on, on Kolkata is it's mostly based on uh, British sources um, and, and, of course, Bengali writings. Uh, there's nothing, uh, there's in, in Partha Chatterjee's book, there's a mention of, of this Malay uh, who came from Penang, um, but there's nothing much about anybody else. Uh, if you see the Chinese writings uh, since at least 1870s, there's a lot of writing on Kolkata. There are many Chinese who are coming in, and I think in order to know this city, uh, I would argue it is perhaps uh, interesting, useful, and perhaps relevant uh, to look at some of these, uh, these uh, sources written in Chinese language, but also written in English by the Chinese. Uh, so you can't have the excuse that I don't know Chinese uh, and don't read those material. They are English sources, and I'll point some of those out. Um, so there are interesting perspectives. I'll come back to this issue at the very end. Uh, but this is also connected to this issue. Um, I don't like this book that, that much, um, but uh, it brings out a very interesting issue of looking at Asia through Asian prisms uh, and looking at different parts of, of Asia through what other Asians have to say uh, and not just necessarily go into the sources by the Europeans or the Americans. Uh, that seems to be one of the important arguments of this book. Uh, and Chen Guangxin, a, a Taiwanese scholar, uh, has, uh, has encouraged us to do that. He also has something called India-China as a method uh, where he uh, says that we should look at the connections between India and China and see what kind of methodology we can uh, come up with. Uh, so this is encouraging us to come up with a new framework of, of analyzing things. And I think that's a very important issue, and it's high time we should do that. Uh, now here, uh, those of you who are in Kolkata know about these things, uh, Hakka noodles. I think if you have not eaten it, uh, eat it. Uh, I don't know how much Hakka it is, but uh, it's noodles. Um, uh, tea, of course, uh, if, if there was no... Uh, uh, China connection, we would not have, have tea. Um, uh, this goes back to bringing off various, not only plants, but people from, from China uh, to grow tea. 
uh, in Darjeeling and other places. Rickshaw, uh, it seems the Chinese actually brought the rickshaw to, uh, to Kolkata as well. So we see these things uh, every day, uh, but somehow we don't think about uh, the China. So next time, I think tea will be offered here, uh, you can think about the Chinese uh, as well. Um, and, and so there are these things that I think uh, deserves, and I'm very happy that Amitav Ghosh has been writing and talking about these issues. Uh, I think his uh, writings will make an impact and help us look into uh, these kinds of, of things that we usually miss uh, in our daily life. Now, uh, the, the, uh, the reasons why I think the Chinese writings uh, on Calcutta uh, are, are important uh, is it gives us a very different perspective of the colonial world. Um, there have been Indian writings on China during the same period, and it gives us a very different perspective of China through Indian eyes. Uh, but we also see, on the other hand, um, the understanding of Kolkata and, and India uh, through Chinese eyes. It gives a very different understanding compared to what the British are writing, for example. The concerns usually are self-reflection as well. So when they are writing about Kolkata or, or India, they are also thinking about China. Uh, so it's, it's a reflection of their own society and themselves that you see uh, in this writing. So uh, if you are writing the British, maybe they are reflecting on their British society as well. But uh, the, the Chinese writings also uh, show us various different uh, complexities of intra-Asian connections. It's not just China and India. Southeast Asia is involved. Many different other groups are involved. Uh, and, and so it gives a story of, of different facets uh, of connections, uh, not only political, not only commercial, but cultural and, and many other things that went on. Painters uh, who came to, to Shantaniketan to study painting and the Nandalal Bose. Uh, and so this is various fascinating episodes uh, that you, you find. Uh, there's also, and I'll show you, uh, I'll talk about one article that talks about the 1946 riots in Kolkata. Uh, and, and, and how about those political transitions that uh, India experienced and what did the Chinese think about it? Uh, and, and so there are these kinds of writings as well about the key uh, events that took place in Kolkata or around Kolkata. Um, the experiences and perceptions of foreign minority, this is about the Chinese community, of course. We do mention there are Chinese there, but we do not talk about how they think about, uh, about Kolkata or India. Um, they, they have written, they had three newspapers, uh, they have other writings, and, and there's one very important writing in English um, that talk about their perception living in the city. Right? Uh, usually when we do the Chinese community in, in Kolkata, we forget that they have a perception. Uh, where whenever a writing about the community takes place, it's from our perspective of what the community does. Uh, but they also have a perspective and a very interesting perspective. So the complexities part that, that uh, I want to talk about is, first of all, clearly laying out that the Chinese are not homogeneous people here. I mean, we are talking about many different groups of Chinese here. Um, so there are the migrants from different regions of China, and that's very important that the Chinese who came did not come from one place in China. They did not speak the same language. Uh, they believed in different things. So we can't take the Chinese immigrants here as one homogeneous community. They are quite diverse. Uh, they, they have problems within themselves. There are many factions, uh, political, cultural, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, there are also traders. Uh, and if you have seen Nila Akash and Nietzsche, uh, you have a Shantung trader there. But uh, there are Yunnanese traders as well who came from Lhasa down to, uh, to Kolkata from Kalingpong. Uh, there are many government officials uh, starting from 1870s, and I'll talk about one of them, uh, quite important, uh, uh, who see Kolkata and, and experience the colonial part of Kolkata coming across for the first time various things that Chinese didn't have and being quite impressed with what the British have done uh, in, in Kolkata. Uh, there are also political prisoners who are brought by the British to Kolkata um, and, and then uh, housed here. There are asylum seekers, there were soldiers uh, during the Second World War, uh, training for the Chinese soldiers took place nearby. Um, there were tourists who came to visit different parts of, of, of Kolkata and West Bengal. It was a very important attraction. That's what I'm trying to uh, impose. Uh, basically, people came here because it was an attractive city. This perhaps would be the first city that the Chinese uh, came to know about. Um, in, in my book that Hari was mentioning, I, I have argued that from around 15th century to the late 19th century, the Chinese really forgot about uh, India. 
So if you compare with some of the earlier writings, the writings that are done between the 16th, 17th, and early 18th century, uh, they are totally messed uh, about the Indian geography. They don't know where Kolkata is. They don't know where the coastal regions are. But starting with the late 19th century, they re-engage uh, with, with uh, India. And, and, and the first city to engage that they engage with is Kolkata. Um, there are various Buddhist monks. Uh, there are also Christian missionaries from China. And I'll talk about one couple uh, Christian missionaries who, who worked uh, in Tangra and, and Bobajar area. Uh, there are many students uh, who came to study here. Um, there were teachers who were especially brought to teach in the Chinese schools from Macian and in, in, in Kwangtung region. There were artists who came here, worked here. So there's a very different groups uh, that, uh, that lived uh, in, in Kolkata and around Kolkata areas. So some of the various important distinctions I think we have to keep in mind, they are divided into speech groups. Hakka, Cantonese, Cantonese has different sub-dialects as well. Uh, in fact, I'm working on one of the sub-dialect groups in Kolkata. Um, there are racial distinctions uh, between Chinese and Chinese who marry locals and have children of that, those marriages. So if you are darker Chinese, you are not the same as a whiter Chinese, let's say fair Chinese. There are lots of these kinds of issues uh, within the Chinese community here. Um, there are also distinctions, and I'll, I'll point out, between intellectual Chinese. And here, Taiyunshan, for example, is a clear I think many of you know Taiyun Shan here, especially those who uh, know about uh, China Bhavan and Shantan Ketan, and how he perceives the non-intellectual people who live in Chinatown. He's very critical of the Chinatown population, so I'll, I'll talk about that. Uh, there are also religious distinctions, um, Christian, Buddhist, non-Buddhist, and so forth. Uh, the usual... Um, just, just briefly about how the migration uh, took place. Um, this is perhaps starting with the uh, 18th century onwards. There's a huge migration of the Chinese, especially to Southeast Asia, different parts of Southeast Asia. Uh, and the coming of these uh, people to, uh, to Kolkata is connected to this uh, larger uh, migration that is taking place out of southern regions of, of, of China. What is important here is, is this map. Because we know um, of the Hakkas and Cantonese, uh, right? I mean, they are uh, the key members of the Chinese community here. But if you look at uh, the different groups here, so uh, if you go to Bobajar, you'll see some of the people who speak a very different dialect of Cantonese, which is different from people who are from the southern uh, part of, of uh, Kwangtung region. Uh, and they are, again, different from people from Hakka or Macian. So they are all from the Kwangtung uh, province, but they speak different languages. Uh, and then they have schools that are taught, I mean, they used to have schools that taught on in, in those dialects or topolects. Um, and, and so th there's clear distinctions among the Chinese who came. Initially, the first hundred years, you could see clear divisions among among the Chinese uh, who lived in, in Kolkata. Uh, now, people that I'll talk about, uh, I don't know how many of you know this, um, the person, uh, this was the light, right? Uh, this is a very famous intellectual called uh, Kang Yo Wei. Uh, I'll talk about his writings. Um, I'll come back to him. I'll not talk about him. I've written about him. He's a very famous Chinese Buddhist monk called Tai Chi. Uh, he came uh, to Kolkata in 1940. Uh, so if you go to the Mahabodhi Society, he actually funded a building. You can see the dedication of the building. Uh, it's, it's, uh, he gave money to the foundation of India-China Studies uh, Center at, at Mahabodhi Society. Uh, he, this person is quite famous. This is Tai Shan. Um, uh, came here, uh, I think, 1928 for the first time. Then he wrote a number of things about his travels in uh, India. Um, but I'm going to use his writing, which is critical of the Chinatown uh, in, in Kolkata. Uh, this is a Chinese press uh, in, in Kolkata. This is one of the three important newspapers that came out. It's Chinese Journal of India. Um, it's read from left to right in Chinese. Um, the people here, this is a missionary couple from Shanghai. 
uh, who came to Kolkata in 1949. I'll talk about their writing and their view uh, of, of, of Kolkata. And, and this is a picture that you can see in Wikipedia, and this is uh, taken by American soldiers in Kolkata about the opium dens uh, in, in, in Chinatown. So there's many, many different kinds of people who came, and, and their writings are very, very different. Right? So there's no single uh, perspective that we see uh, in, in these writings. And, and that's why, so these are the people I'll be talking about. The first Chinese who is mentioned in sources, uh, his name is Achiu. So, you know, Achipur uh, is named after him. Uh, and, and so he is supposed to be the ancestor of all the Chinese uh, in, in Kolkata. Uh, and, and so there in Achipur, there's a tomb and people go uh, and visit uh, the tomb every, uh, every Chinese New Year. Uh, he has a perspective of the people in Kolkata. Uh, so I'll talk about him. Uh, Huang Mao Tsai was one of the early uh, government officials, perhaps the first government official to come from uh, Qing China to, to Kolkata in the uh, 1870s, uh, and Kang Youwei, the important uh, uh, intellectual from China who sought asylum basically because of a failed reform uh, that he started, uh, and he escaped first to Penang, and from Penang he came here. Um, Tayun Shan and his critique of Chinatown, just to show you the diversity of the writings. Uh, David and Mary Lamb were the missionaries, uh, and, and they talk about the black hole. It's not about the incident, uh, but the place uh, they see is as a black hole. Um, and then I'll use this Chinese very interesting record about partition and what happens in 1946. Uh, he was here, he was an eyewitness uh, to the killings that took place. Um, and, and it's a very fascinating four page detailed record uh, of what he saw uh, in Kolkata. Um, Li Kuai Yun is, is this very, very interesting person who uh, lived here most of her life. Uh, then uh, went to Canada and, and did her master's and now doing her PhD on the Chinese community in, in, uh, in India. Uh, her work, recent work is how the Chinese were treated in Dioli uh, in the internment camps uh, after 1962. Uh, she has a very important book. Um, it's her, her story. I think it's quite important. And I'll talk briefly about the contemporary writings. Uh, so I'll, I'll go through some of the, there are them much more. I'm just going to give you some snippets and I'll come back to the question, are these relevant at all uh, for understanding uh, Kolkata. So the early Chinese uh, encounters and this person, uh, Warren Hastings, uh, is quite fascinating. And, and I've been working on the Bogley mission that, that uh, he instigated to, to, to Tibet. Uh, and this is 1774, 1775, uh, the mission, the first British mission to, to Tibet. Uh, and, and he was one of the persons trying to get into uh, into into China and and the larger context to this is uh, rivalries among various colonial powers, the Dutch and and uh, and, and this gradually the French later on trying to get into China uh, and and it seems Warren Hastings was quite interested in doing so and he tried both uh, the coastal region through Canton and, uh, and and through Tibet as well. So the Bogle mission uh, seems to be one very important step to try to get into Beijing, the, uh, the, the Qing capital at, at that time, uh, which led to another very important site in Kolkata, which is the Bhut Bagan, right? I don't know how many of you have been there. This is something he granted to the Tibetan pilgrims who would come every year to go to various Buddhist sites. Uh, so this was uh, his doing, Warren Hastings, uh, to promote uh, the connections between Tibet uh, and, and, and Bengal and Bihar. Uh, he was also the person who gave a land grant to Achiu in exchange for tea, and this later became Achipur, uh, and this is again a place to go and visit. Um, he was clearly interested in opening up the tra uh, routes between uh, Kolkata and, and China, uh, and, and also important in the plantation of tea. He seems to be one of the important people who pushed for bringing plants from, from China uh, and, and growing them in, in, in India. So his, his role is quite forgotten in this China connection, but I think he is, is quite an important figure in this early connections. This is the um, uh, tomb of Achiu, and then if you go to uh, the Bo Bajar uh, Chinatown, one of the uh, temples has his image uh, with his wife. Uh, he had two wives, one Chinese, one Muslim, um, but they of course don't depict the Muslim wife here, but uh, if this is a Chinese wife. We don't know how he looked like, um, but clearly what, what he, this document from, 
from the British archives is quite fascinating. So he is given uh, this land in Achipur, but uh, and then he sets up a sugar mill uh, in Achipur. Uh, and, and remember, the word for sugar is chini. And if you ask me, I'll tell you why that is called chini. Um, uh, doesn't have to do with Chinese, um, but. Uh, he he's, he's quite annoyed with the fact that all his workers that he brings from China go to Calcutta. They don't stay in Archipur. Uh, and so he launches an official complaint that these Chinese in Kolkata are taking away my workers. They're obviously paying them more. Uh, and the British then issue an edict uh, basically saying that this should not happen. Those in Kolkata uh, should not take away the workers from Archie's uh, sugar mill. So you can see the distinction between the Chinese uh, themselves uh, and, and different groups of Chinese who have already come uh, to India in, in, in the late 18th century. Uh, so there are a couple of these documents from the early phases, and this is how we know uh, the, the earliest Chinese uh, came to Kolkata in 1780s. Uh, this is from 1781. Um, but there are also uh, British records uh, of what's happening. This is clearly showing how these Chinese are gradually getting integrated into the uh, society of, of Kolkata. These are uh, basically the carpenters uh, and how the carpenters uh, become quite popular because Bengalis are quite lazy. Uh, they, say, uh, uh, they, don't, uh, they do work in four days and the Chinese do it in one day still continues today, right? Um, and, and, and so this, this is the perception that develops and clearly what uh, many of the Chinese themselves point out that they like working for the British because they are good paymasters, not the Bengalis. Uh, and, and so these kinds of perceptions start uh, developing quite, quite commonly in the 1860s already. So these are some of the drawings that Grant made of, of various things. He has a couple of other drawings. He used to write letters to his mother and he would write, uh, draw these sketches and, send and, and describe the places that he was visiting. So these are some of the early um, uh, complexities, let's say, about the different types of Chinese and what they are doing uh, in Kolkata. Now, the first writings about uh, Kolkata comes from these two people, and these are quite early as well. This is Huang Mao Tsai. Um, not many people know about him. He wrote three books on, on India. Uh, he came uh, in 1879, 26 March, he arrived in Calcutta. Uh, he came from Sichuan province. Uh, his agenda was to find out uh, if the British are going to attack uh, China through the border Burma into Sichuan. Uh, this is after the Opium War. Uh, the, the Chinese had suddenly realized that there is something called the British uh, and they don't live very far away, they are nearby. Uh, and so there was an interest in finding out if Kolkata, India would be the launching pad for other attacks into China. So his mission was to map the region. He drew many maps of the region from Sichuan all the way to Bengal. Uh, he also then wrote about his journeys. Um, so he, his three works are really, all of them survive, unfortunately, all of them in, in Chinese. Uh, we are trying to translate them into English. Um, but he comes, uh, and, and he is quite impressed with Calcutta. I mean, it's the largest port in Southern Ocean. He goes to various art schools. He goes to Alipur Zoo. He goes to Indian Museum. He goes to Botanical Garden. Uh, he's, he's going around Kolkata and looking at, quite impressed uh, with the streets. Uh, not today, I think. Um, uh, the vehicles, the street lamps. He has a lot to say about how the street lamps. Um, availability of tap water. I don't know if we still have that. Uh, but uh, he was quite impressed with, with and, and he praises the British, uh, that what the British have done in Kolkata uh, it's quite impressive, and sometimes he writes back and, and takes his notes saying that we should learn from it. Uh, we, should, we should do the same things uh, in China. This is the reflection part of it, right? He's not just looking at, at Kolkata, but trying to see what can be done in, 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 uh, in, in China itself. The railway system, he was quite fascinated with. He was traveling in India uh, on the railways and the telegraph. He was saying, look, you know, all the British go on summer vacation in Darjeeling, uh, and they work from Darjeeling, and how they communicate is through telegraph system. Uh, this is a means of communication. So he has a lot of things to write about uh, about this communications in uh, in India, so he was later on criticized by by saying nice things about uh, India and British India, uh, and and the opposite happens when this person Kang Yo Wei comes. I mean, he is he is one of the two uh, leading intellectuals of of of, uh, of China. 
in the later half of the Qing period. Uh, and, and he was one who promoted constitutional monarchy, started the so-called 100 Days Reform. Uh, it failed, uh, and many associated with the 100 Days Reforms were either arrested or killed. He escaped. Uh, to Southeast Asia and then uh, came to Darjeeling. Uh, he lived in Darjeeling for a number of years. Uh, he came back again for a second time in 1909. Um, and he's very critical of India, so very much different from Huang Mao Tsai. Uh, he, in fact, has a, a, a theory of social Darwinism that only the yellow and the white race will survive and all other races will die out. Uh, look at the Indians. Uh, they, they, they are so divided. They speak so many different languages. Uh, they won't last too long. And in fact, he writes to his student uh, saying that if we have something in China, let's not follow the Indian way uh, because India will never be united uh, because the language issues create provinces and states uh, and that should not be our political example, uh, he writes. Um, and he has criticism. You see that Huang Mao Tsai write, uh, liked the streets. He hated the streets. So he, this is quite interesting. He said, streets of Calcutta are not frequently maintained and are filthy like those in Beijing. Um, right? So he's again reflecting, OK, so he is perhaps not very interested in what's happening in Beijing. Uh, although the British have ruled over 100 years, they have not been able to address this problem of, of being filthy. Uh, so his writings, again, uh, just to point out some of the issues, are quite different, very critical uh, of, of, uh, of uh, Calcutta uh, and, and the Indians. Um, but he likes the British. Uh, he meets the many, many of the British officials here, um, and, and that's part of learning about constitutional monarchy. Um, the Chinatown part of it, by the time uh, Kang Youwei comes, there are three sites in Kolkata. Um, now, this relates to what is a para, right? We call China para, right? Uh, and and Partho Chatterjee has written about uh, paras. But the Chinese paras are very different. The, the two that we know of, one in Tangra and one in Bobajar area, they are very different paras. Um, uh, so the Bovajar area is very open. It fits uh, what Partho is describing as, as uh, para. Uh, Tangra is a very close, gated community. Uh, they don't want to mix with others. Uh, and, and these are by the Hakkas. So, so if we call it a neighborhood, a Chinese neighborhood or para, we have to make a difference between Bovajar uh, and Tangra. Uh, one uh, dominated by Cantonese, the Bovajar area, and Tangra by the Hakkas. They don't like each other. They, they call names and other things. Um, but uh, Clearly, there are different groups of, of Chinese who are settled in the early 20th century. Uh, and this is uh, when Kayun Shan uh, comes uh, to, to Kolkata and Shantani Ketan. Um, he is very much uh, unhappy with Chinatown as a symbol of China. Um, and, and he uh, just says that, OK, Chinatown has various temples, restaurants, shops, and theater, but it's filthy. It's dreadful. It's a very strange place. Uh, in fact, he suggests to his Bengali friends, you should not go there. It's, it's a dirty place. Um, he's talking mostly about the Bovajar area, uh, the place where traditional practices are. So he is a new life movement person. He is critical of the traditional values of China. Uh, but he says it does not symbolize China. Don't think Chinatown is China. Um, there's opium being sold here. The drugs are peddled. It's a long article that he writes. It's very, very critical. Uh, he says, uh, don't eat in Chinese restaurants. So in, in Chinatown. They, they, they are not Chinese food. Uh, it's not symbol of, of, of China. So I see you are doing heritage walk, so you should perhaps translate that and put this here. Um, uh, so they are, uh, so he says, uh, and this is, I, I found quite fascinating that he talks about uh, foot binding uh, in, in Chinatown. Uh, of course, foot binding in China was related to sexual uh, uh, issues with, with the men. Um, but he says in Chinatown in Kolkata also, there are women who show their bounded feet. Um, and that's not good. It's again not a good thing about Chinese society. Uh, there's lots of criminal activities in Chinatown. Um, it's inhibited, and this is a distinction between, you know, Tai Shan as an intellectual, educated person, and many of the Chinese in Chinatown are workers, laborers, uneducated, or people who are smuggled into these places. Uh, and he calls them hygi unhygienic migrants. Uh, these are, and who live with lower class Indians. He himself is actually 
uh, buddies with Rabindranath Tagore and, and uh, upper class Indian intellectuals. So he looks down both on the in Chinese workers and laborers and Indian lower class people. Uh, so those of you who are, I know there are a number of people who study Thayun Shan and place him very high above, but he has very interesting views. Um, I would say some very negative views, both about Chinatown and, and Tibet uh, also. And the concepts of, of restaurant, he's very critical of the restaurants. So Alice, don't go to a Chinese restaurant in Chinatown um, because it's not traditional Chinese. Uh, you don't see real China in Chinatown. Uh, and, and I think this is a fascinating article uh, that uh, people need to study in order to understand how this uh, highly educated intellectuals, uh, Chinese, thought about Chinatowns. So we see Chinatowns from our perspective. The Chinese, like him, see Chinatown very differently. Uh, now, those who live in Chinatown see Chinatown very differently as well. And this is where uh, Li uh, Kuai Yun's uh, view comes in. Uh, and, and she is a resident uh, first in Bo Bajar, uh, she's a Hakka, uh, and then uh, to Tangra. So her parents came to, uh, to Kolkata in 1920s. Uh, father became quite rich, had three uh, shoe stores. Um, now she talks about all these rituals and practices and ceremonies uh, that she is participating. The, the filth that Thayun Shan talks about is part of life. She has no complaint about the filth or dirtiness. She talks about dead birds and animals and, and mosquitoes and flies, but that doesn't affect her life. She, she goes into this, this society uh, uh, and, and, and lives her life with her family. Uh, there are concerns with monsoon not coming early uh, or flooding if monsoon comes uh, too early. Um, it's not, filth then is never a hindrance uh, uh, for her, neither are the other people living in Chinatown. She is friendly with the various other groups, Bengalis, non-Bengalis and so forth. Um, there are apprehensions about politics in both India and China. So they are thinking about the changes in the late 40s um, and what is going to happen with the Chinese immigrants, uh, and, and especially at 1962. She experiences all these. 49 is a major transition period for China, uh, and many of the Chinese here were affected by that. 62 was another event where the Chinese here were affected by uh, the political changes between the relationship between India and China. I'll, I'll just read uh, here one uh, episode from her book. Uh, and, and she's talking about uh, the Chinese uh, during 62 war going to Maidan uh, and saying that we hate Mao Zedong. Uh, he is a criminal, uh, and we support the Indian government, and they uh, assert their Indianness rather than Chineseness uh, in, in, in Maidan. Uh, and they talk about how we Chinese have lived here for a long time. We are not uh, PRC people. Right? We are we are locally born people like herself. Uh, and and so she, they go to a shop where the Indian Bengali shopkeeper says, "Go home, China." Uh, and, and they come across a number of such places where people say you go back to China and, and you know that uh, in this time uh, many people, around 3,000 Chinese were deported, uh, many of them were born here uh, and many others were put into internment camp in, in Dioli, they lived there for five years. So here is, is what they were afraid of. Uh, and I'll read this. Uh, that night, after they come across these people asking them to go back to China, not back but to China, Many of them were not to China any time. So mother opened our emergency packs. She examined the clothing inside. When the Indian police began to intern the Chinese three months ago, it should be months, uh, she made one of these packs for each of us. In my pack, I had two changes of clothing, three uh, seaters or sweaters, I don't know, a small blanket, a metal mug, a plate and a spoon, small package of rice, two pairs of socks, and one pair of shoes. We slept with our packs beside us, money pouches swung into our pajamas and our shoes and socks by the bed. The police usually came in the middle of the night. Every Chinese in Calcutta had a pack. Uh, and uh, you can see this uh, reflected in some of the official documents uh, exchanged between Indian and Chinese governments about the treatment of the Chinese. Uh, and, and they would point out that uh, they had just very little thing to eat when they were moved from Kolkata to Rajasthan. Uh, so this is uh, this is a very interesting book, and I, I'll recommend uh, that uh, this is this is it actually the the thing I was reading from. 
but I would uh, recommend buying this book. It's published by Penguin. Uh, now, if you have seen this uh, thing on, on, on the flyer, I just wanted to say what this is. Uh, the, uh, many of these people who were deported uh, went back to a China that was going through its own political problems. This was greatly forward, uh, and people had died, and so forth, so forth. And they were put into something called the farming villages. Uh, many of the, these Chinese still live there. Um, so I visited them a couple of years back. Um, and this is the third generation of the people who were deported, and they live. Um, they have Indian names. They wear not every day. Uh, this is a holy celebration. Uh, they, f they have Diwali celebrations. They sing Indian songs. They make samosas, jalebis, uh, and they, they try to uh, live their Indian life uh, in, in China. And not only them, but their grandchildren as well. So these are the grandchildren of these people who are deported. It's just a fascinating to see how this connection uh, to Kolkata still remains as nostalgia. Uh, among these uh, these Chinese who have 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 left uh, Kolkata, they all want to come back, but getting a visa to Ch India is not easy, uh, right? Uh, so this is uh, one of the other things that I want to talk about: how the Chinese encountered uh, political changes uh, in both India and China. So one of the first things here is in 1946. This is the article I was talking about. This appears. Um, on the 30th August edition of 1946 in this World Affairs Journal in, in, uh, in Kolkata. And, and this person who was here for a number of, of years uh, is so disgusted by what's happening. Uh, and he says, this is not a riot, this is a war. And he is going out on the streets and looking at uh, what's happening. He says, it made me lose faith in India after seeing the conflict between Hindus and, and Muslims. Um, so he says, uh, he looks at the, what he calls the senseless butchery uh, that's taking place uh, in the three days, uh, 17th, 18th, and 19th uh, of August, 1946. Uh, he gives, I think it matches with the description uh, that appears in other newspapers, 4,000 dead, 10,000 injured, 100,000 left homeless. Um, and, and what he argues here is what, it's not just Hindus and Muslims, who gains from it, he argues, are the British. The hand of the British in India is strengthened by, by what is between uh, the Hindus and, 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 and Muslim. And he gives um, this picture, it's a very, um, uh, not very clear image, but these are the bo dead bodies uh, lying on the streets. And he talks about how people are decapitated, uh, beaten to dead, uh, burned, uh, and, and so forth. So uh, this is one of the uh, only detailed eyewitness accounts uh, that we have about the 1946. So if you want to get a different perspective of what was happening in, in Kolkata in 1946, I think this article um, would be quite important to look at. Um, also a transition here, the political transition affecting the other way. So um, I think many of you, if you go to Chinatown, you'll see these monuments, the Grace Lingliang Church uh, and the Lingliang School. Uh, they still survive, they still function. Uh, there are students there. And the founders of those uh, schools and churches were uh, David and Mary Lamb, who came from Shanghai in 1949. Uh, they lef left Shanghai because uh, China was going through political transition from Kuomintang to PRC uh, and missionary work uh, they, were, uh, they were thinking will be stopped once Mao Zedong becomes a leader. So they came to Kolkata to work and spread uh, Christianity among the Chinese community here. Uh, and they wrote this book. Um, it is narrated uh, to somebody who writes uh, on their behalf um, about, about uh, what, what is happening. And here, again, uh, it's quite interesting, and I'll read this, um, uh, about uh, how Mao Zedong's new China is affecting uh, them and the Chinese living in, in Kolkata. So David was bold, even though the broad controlled uh, the board controlled the church. The visitor had no statistical power over him at all, yet, yet he earnest, earnestly was trying to persuade David to join the atheistic forces of Mao's new China. And this is, this is true. Uh, many of these PRC uh, consulate people were going to schools and other places trying to make all the Chinese here uh, get Chinese PRC passports. 
the lands were in precarious position. The West Bengal government was amongst the earliest states to recognize communist China. The Indians loved China back in those days, uh, but David, Mary, and Sarah were out of step with uh, the godless regime. And this is critique of, of course, the PRC um, that has seized power in their homeland. The Reds easily could have asked the Indians to expel these stateless missionaries with ties to the Republic of China. This is coming down in Taiwan. Um, many Chinese in Calcutta were persuaded to join in the spirit of communist China and to support the new regime across the border to the north. They visited Chinese consulate and enthusiastically read the propaganda. The communist government opened banks in Chinatown and offered low interest loans freely to the Chinese people. The only condition was that they accept a People's Republic passport. All the laundry stores you see were funded by these loans that people got uh, from the PRC consulate. Uh, but in 1962, uh, they were the first ones to be arrested uh, and deported uh, and sent to internment camps. Uh, so this this is again something uh, about the political change and how people got affected by these political changes. Uh, I'll, I'll end with some of the contemporary issues and, and this again I think uh, quite important to understand how the Chinese are looking at Kolkata of the present day. Uh, so when uh, 62 happened, of course, there were very few, uh, or at, at least one or two Chinese from PRC would just come uh, to Kolkata. The first ones to come was from Taiwan, actually, in 1970s. Uh, I don't know if you know about this, uh, Ko Liang Hui, uh, very famous Taiwanese novelist uh, who arrived in Kolkata in, I think, 1971. Um, and, and she writes about the stranger uh, in, in Kolkata. Uh, this is uh, in, in Chinese. Um, and she was arrested in the immigration. She was carrying uh, a, a bag made of leopard skin. Uh, and there was a ban on carrying animal uh, skin products. Uh, and then she talks about her experience uh, in, uh, in, uh, in India. He was, she was not jailed, but she was taken to, uh, to, to the, the, the court, and, and a case was launched against her. She was not let uh, to leave uh, Kolkata. Um, and, and she talks about Kolkata that still with that case, I still love Kolkata, she said. Uh, I would like to come back. Uh, and, and she talks about an Indian who uh, actually helps us, uh, her throughout this process. And when she is leaving uh, uh, the, the, the airport, uh, the pe people there ask, what happened to your friend? Uh, what was his name? And she does not remember, or she, she remembers that she never asked his last name. Uh, and, and there was no way to contact him again back. Uh, so uh, she, is, she is quite a famous writer, and, and she has uh, died. Um, but, but this is a fascinating take uh, on, on Kolkata uh, in 1970s. Um, the other one is the uh, recent, and how the Chinese are seeing Kolkata, and, and this is Calcutta uh, dream of a declining colonial city. Uh, and you see mostly negative images of, of Kolkata, how dirty it is, um, how it has not progressed. Um, but there are others who would also write uh, glowingly uh, of Kolkata. This is uh, on, the, on the right is, is a person from Yunnan. Uh, and, he, and he goes around and he sees uh, Calcutta as a spiritual town, uh, a city, again, uh, emphasizing that the things of the perspectives of the Chinese are, are quite different. The other one is, I think one of the things people get impressed is that crows in, in Kolkata, uh, they, they, they are all, always awake, it seems. Um, and and uh, this, this Chinese writer has a fascinating take on the crows uh, in, in Kolkata uh, and, and how they keep him awake and, and so forth. Uh, so it's, it's different ways of looking uh, at, at, at Kolkata that we see. Uh, with the social media, we have blogs uh, that uh, appear. Uh, and sometimes uh, it's interesting to see what people are writing uh, on the blogs, uh, many times critical, but sometimes very, very supportive of, of Kolkata as a fascinating city, impressed with it, uh, visiting here and, and wanting to come back uh, again to Kolkata. So the contemporary views of, of, of Kolkata is also quite diverse uh, and, and, uh, and gives different perspective about how the Chinese see an Indian city uh, and how they look back at China by looking at Kolkata. Uh, and and that always shows up in their writing. They refer back to what they saw in, in China and how it relates to China. So I think it's, it's the connections between, let's say, India and China through the writings. And, and this is not unique. Other writings about Indian travelers going abroad also reflect on their own country when they are seeing uh, uh, new countries and so forth. So let me come back 
to this question that I asked, are these Chinese writings on Calcutta relevant or useful? I think you should be answering that, looking at some of these. Uh, but uh, I spend uh, most of my academic life looking at uh, Chinese sources on India. Um, I'll talk about Xuanzang and Fasian. I think everybody will know, right? Uh, Fahian and Indian Chinese. Um, but Fasian and, and Xuanzang, their writings are very important for early uh, Indian history. Uh, it connections not only between China and, and India, but different types of Buddhist practices, different uh, 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 areas of China. So Cunningham papers, if you look, Cunningham was very impressed with Xuanzang. He actually found many places in India based on the writing of Xuanzang. He has a map which is basically tracks uh, Xuanzang's travels and he goes to many of these places. And he digs up, he finds many places. Uh, so Fashians and, and Xuanzang's writings are very, very important. Uh, the Chinese also had various records about India all the way to the 15th century. Uh, so sometimes they are very important to understand what's happening within uh, India as well from the Chinese sources. Sometimes they are biased, sometimes they are wrong, but still you, you see uh, records that uh, usually we don't find in, in many sources. What about these sources uh, and starting from the 19th century onwards? How useful are they? I think they are quite useful. Uh, I think uh, they give a very different perspective. If we go back to uh, Chen Guangxin's idea of looking at Asia through Asia, uh, using an Asian perspective, and the Chinese writings do give us not only a different perspective compared to the British, what they are writing, or compared to others who are coming and writing about Kolkata. Uh, it's, 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 it's a study of Kolkata through Chinese eyes that looks at different things that we usually miss out. Uh, the British are not going to write about how a Chinese living in Kolkata are feeling uh, inside. Uh, and, and so it's, it's, it's quite fascinating to see how the Chinese have talked about different aspects of Kolkata from a point of view of a Chinese uh, and reflecting back on, on China itself. So the China-India, China-Kolkata connections uh, shows out. And I think it is very important if we are going to study Kolkata uh, and understand Kolkata uh, and understand the cosmopolitan nature of Kolkata, the complicated nature of uh, uh, Kolkata, uh, is to also look at the Chinese sources. There are some English sources that, that you can read and, and you can you get a different perspective. So the last five years I spent in Kolkata reading various sources, I think I see Calcutta very differently. Uh, and I think if you read uh, the Chinese sources, uh, you will also find Kolkata very different. And I think a step has been taken by Amitav Ghosh. I think uh, this may be the first step to do it. It's not Chinese, Chinese, uh, but Amitav Ghosh has used a number of very interesting sources uh, to write his Ibis trilogy and, and uh, especially his, his uh, third book, The Flood of Fire, which talks about the Opium War, uh, is quite fascinating about the Indian implication uh, of this war or even the trade, how the Indians benefited from the opium trade. I think it would be a good point to start with Amitav Ghosh and then get to other sources. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much indeed, Tan, Tan Sen. Um, the, the floor is open, obviously, for uh, questions. Um, I think uh, two points uh, certainly Tan Sen um, has stressed, and uh, perhaps those are things that can be taken up, which is that um, somehow or another, uh, the experience of China and the way in which China encounters the world itself uh, shapes the way in which many of these travelers, when they come to India, uh, assess the experience of, of this city. Uh, and this city, over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries, after all, was the great imperial city. Uh, uh, Delhi never quite made it to that status because its grandeur came uh, either too early or too late. Um, and for much of this period of China's uh, major transition in the 19th and 20th centuries when many Chinese were traveling and, and moving around. Um, it was through Calcutta that they came to experience um, what was happening in India. So it was a very important experience for them. And I think that's something that requires to be stressed. It's uh, in actually simply talking about the Chinese coming to Calcutta. 
it's uh, a much broader encounter that he is dealing with, which is the the Chinese experience of Indian of of modernization through India, um, which occurs through the city. Um, it's this city is the is one of the main uh, thoroughfares for this. But there are two levels to this, um, and I think that also emerges, or three levels really, if you include the the modern, which is that on the one hand there are people who are coming in order to go back. And then there are the people who simply come. And the people who come uh, are really people who are crossing all sorts of boundaries and becoming different kinds of people. And even when they return, as it were, in inverted commas, that is when uh, having been born here, they're forced to return, uh, they carry with them a lot of what they have become uh, when they're here. Uh, now, those are two very different experiences. And then, of course, there's the third experience of of the world today and the way in which perhaps uh, this declining colonial city, as it was, is viewed by uh, a, a neighborhood which is moving across a different transition path uh, uh, that uh, is is quite exciting and uh, perhaps which leaves this, this experience behind. But whatever the case, uh, there will be many questions and uh, I hand over this mic to Tansen to uh, to answer them, and I think there is a, a mic around the place for you to to pose your questions. Yeah, that's that, uh, always an interesting talk by Tansin. And uh, I have one question on this uh, deportation to Deoli. Uh, in Calcutta, there were at least about 20 to 30,000 Chinese at that time, out of which, uh, as you mentioned, about 3,000 were deported. So what was this, uh, why were the police selective about uh, the 3,000 people whom they chose? Did they have any communistic leanings or something? Or was that the reason? Because I had a lot of Chinese friends who were in school with me. They were not affected. Some were affected, some were not affected, you know? Yes. Um, so in, in 49, um, there were clear political division within the Chinese community, those who supported the PRC and those who supported the Kuomintang. Um, and, and those later on took on the PRC passports, right? So those were the first targets, those who had PRC passports and who had been in, in uh, India for a number of years. So they were the first ones uh, to be arrested. Uh, those who supported uh, Kuomintang actually gained the upper hand at this point. Uh, and they created a group to support the Indian army against the PRC. So they would donate money. So this, this uh, thing that Kwai Yun Lee is talking about in Maidan uh, was organized by some of them who were uh, Kuomintang supporters and now got the opportunity to support the Indian army. So they would donate a lot of money to the Indian government. There's a picture of, of them going to the, the chief minister of Bengal and, and giving money to them. So the the, the, those who were coming down were not arrested. But there were also people who didn't have any papers. Right? Uh, and, and they were also arrested because the Indian government uh, thought almost all Chinese are spies. Uh, and and uh, it was not only in Kolkata, in Assam as well. Uh, people who had no connections to PRC, uh, they were arrested. So it's, deportation was to send to them to PRC. There were also others who were taken to Dioli. They were not sent back to uh, China. So they were there for five years. And many of them came back to Kalimpong, to Darjeeling, to Kolkata, to find nothing of their home existed. So I, I think there was, uh, I've looked into how this policy starts. And, and usually the Chinese blame Nehru. Actually, Nehru didn't have much to do with this. Uh, this was the home ministry uh, deciding on this policy. Uh, he may have uh, asked him. Uh, so uh, I have a different perspective of Nehru, but uh, clearly this was a home ministry who had been urging Nehru for a long time that we can't trust the Chinese. Um, but it was indiscriminate uh, who they were arrested. Those who had PRC parts were very few, very few, yeah. And uh, today, of course, you've touched on a very uh, uh, raw nerve where uh, we mix with Chinese in the 50s and 60s in schools. And I've been there lately also, several years. Now, why are the Chinese so fond of uh, the Kali temple, OK, uh, on Bobazar? What is so special about that Kali to them? So, so the, the Kali temple uh, is actually in Tangra. Um, and there's one in, in Bobazar, but that's not Chinese Kali temple. Yeah. So. Yeah. 
so so it's very interesting to see how the Firangi Firangi Kali Temple. Yes, that's in Bobajar, but the the other one is uh, yes. So so there are many stories about it, but it has also to do with the nature of Chinese religion. Uh, the Chinese religion, if you see in, in Southeast Asia and even in Kolkata, they tend to incorporate many local gods and goddesses. And this happens uh, in, clearly in Southeast Asia where some of the local deities are uh, incorporated because they are in a new location uh, and new location would have their own uh, deities who would work for them, so they will inc include them in their temples. It's easy, uh, very common to find that in uh, in, in Southeast Asia, for example. Here, uh, the Kali one uh, is specially related to fertility uh, aspects. So it seems the, the story circulated that if you worship Kali, you'll have a son, right? Not daughter, but son. Uh, and and uh, and and that seems to be the reason why many of the people in the Bobajar started frequented frequenting the Firangi uh, Kalibari. But then um, then they established uh, one of the families actually uh, got a son after worshiping a Kali and established that temple in Tangra. Uh, and and then it it circulated uh, in, within the Tangra community and and they started praying there. Uh, and and so so it's it seems that uh, Kali is perceived as a fertility goddess for the Chinese and not for what we perceive Kali to be. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, when, so the the people who stayed back during the uh, Nakshal movement were mostly Kuomintang supporters. Uh, so they were not uh, communist supporters here. They were all either arrested or deported. Uh, so I don't think. Uh, uh, they had uh, so so you have to realize that the the Chinese community is not very politically engaged. Right, this is one of the problems we face when we are trying to revive uh, the Chinatown. Um, is that they don't have representation. Uh, they don't have any. Uh, I don't think they've come under OBC or or backward classes. Nothing. So they. I mean, they are totally a forgotten community here. Uh, because they don't have any kind of representation, political representation as, as such. Uh, so in that period, you have to think of the Chinese being afraid of all Indians. Because for, for them, almost every Indian is a policeman. They might arrest them. Right? So still today, they find it difficult to talk to. So anthropological research among the Chinese community by an Indian is very difficult. They will not talk to you, uh, and, and they will not say what they feel uh, is, is important. So it's OK for the Chinese to go in and do research on, on them. It's very difficult for, for Indians uh, to do research on the community. The fear of 62 is so ingrained in their minds that they are not going to talk to you. Uh, and so in, in national thing, they would not participate. That would get them arrested and, and deported, so they would stay away from that. Yeah, yeah. So Hong Kong is not PRC until 1997. So, uh, so that connection to Taiwan remained. Uh, that connection to Hong Kong remained. Uh, but uh, it, it seems that uh, uh, the PRC connection was not there in, in 70s. Could not be there in 70s because we didn't have ambassadorial connections with China until 1978. So, so the Chinese who remained would have connections to Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong, and mostly to Toronto. Uh, and, and you are right that they would come back and marry people locally in Hakka uh, communities. There's still marriage which is going on between those who have gone to Toronto and those who stay here. What is the volume of writings on Naxalbari uh, from Chinese sources? You know? Because you have Beijing Review, for example, yeah. famously saying, what do I know, a spring thunder and all that. At least that is what we like to believe in India. So was there any sustained writing, you know? No. Uh, I, and I think the, the, the reason perhaps is that they were absent from here. Uh, those who stayed back were not the, even, you know, we would have expected Taiyun Shan. And, and one of the problems with Taiyun Shan's writing is he never talked about sensitive topics. He never talked about the deportation of the Chinese or their internment. Right? He talked about the Buddhist connections between India and China, but he never actually talked about or took a stand about what was happening to the Chinese community. So he would be the one person to actually be engaged with this intellectually. He never did that. And neither did Tan Zhong, his son. Right? So these are the people who knew China quite well, who knew India quite well. So if they don't engage in this kind of analysis of this very important 
thing that's happening in Bengal, who will do it? The Chinese are not coming in the 70s, right? Uh, and, and what you find in the literature about uh, Nakshal movement uh, or uh, Maoist movement is criticism now. They, they want to stand back. Uh, there are reports about uh, the Chinese supporting some of these movements in the border areas, uh, but uh, that may be a government uh, issues because of the relations between India and China. But there has not been a very good study of the Naxal movement by a Chinese scholar uh, so far. I hope there's one. They, sh they should look into that. It's not a very simple issue, as we know. Uh, I don't think the Chinese have done uh, an extensive study of the, the Naxal movement, which they need to actually do. Good evening, sir. It was a very nice uh, presentation, and I have uh, cited uh, some of your articles in my own work. Uh, but uh, I belong to the faculty of geography. So regarding quantitative data, I'm not getting uh, the data of the Chinese population right from 1961 census. So like, how can I, what is the way of uh, getting those data? Can you give any suggestion? Did you collect any data? Yes, uh, yeah, it's, it's difficult uh, uh, to, to get the data. I mean, we can just guess, uh, and our guess, uh, I think, is about 3,000 now, or how many? No, 2,000. 2000? Yeah, yeah, and declining. Like 61, 71, 81. Yeah, if you find it, give it to me too. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's a problem. And, and you should not also believe in the census. And I think that's a problem as well. Uh, when the British did census in many places, they were very problematic. Uh, and I think, uh, yeah, yeah, don't depend on census. I think uh, just see the, uh, the people here and talk to them. I don't know if you have tried talking to them. Yeah, uh, and, and one person who has done actually very good work on the geography of, uh, of, of the Chinatowns is Joini Bonerji. Uh, who is now teaching in, in Delhi. Uh, and, and so uh, she has mapped these uh, uh, urban towns uh, and, and paras. Yeah. Best of luck. Uh, I was curious if you could comment on uh, the relations between the Chinese diaspora in uh, India and that in North America, in particular the US. Also maybe commenting on uh, the juxtaposition between the experiences of the diaspora in these two uh, spaces. Uh, that's a very big issue. Um, so maybe not North, um, not uh, USA, but Canada. Uh, so Kwai Yun Lee, who's, who wrote this last Dragon Dance, uh, actually lives in Toronto. Uh, and uh, uh, she is writing about the experiences of the Indian Chinese in Toronto. Uh, and uh, she calls them people with triple identities, Chinese, Indian, and Canadian. Uh, and it's fascinating to see what happens in Toronto where there are other migrants from different parts of China, but also Chinese who had settled in the Caribbeans, Chinese who were in Southeast Asia, Chinese who were in India. Uh, and, and you can see these kinds of different identities uh, being uh, uh, continued in Toronto because one is Chinese Indian. Uh, one is Chinese Caribbean, one is Chinese Southeast Asian, whatever. So those kinds of uh, uh, very complicated identities continue to exist uh, in these places where the re-migration happens, right? So when they go to a second place after the first place they settle in. So um, in Kolkata, the, the Chinese community is very different uh, from many of the places in Southeast Asia, for example. Right? Um, and uh, the connections between many of the Southeast Asian uh, Chinese and, and, and PRC are really opened up after 78. They have been engaging with uh, the People's Republic of China. They, they sponsor various temples and things back in their homelands. Uh, this did not happen until very recently among the Kolkata Chinese. Um, uh, and still they are not so prosperous as such to fund things. Uh, in, in China. So uh, in all these places, uh, the, the diasporic experiences of the Chinese community are quite different. Uh, and, and, and again, we should not lump them together. Uh, and as I argued, within India itself, within Kolkata itself, the experiences are very different uh, from Hakkas to Cantonese, within the, the Cantonese community. So you can see that uh, in, in marriages among the Hakkas here in Kolkata, they don't want to marry anybody outside the Hakka community. Uh, right? uh, Cantonese are, are perhaps, because they are declining much faster, they marry 
and once they marry either a Muslim or a Hindu, uh, it becomes problematic for those families to continue to stay within that community. Uh, so the, the racial thing I was I was talking about, and, and this happens actually. Uh, I found in China when I, I looked at these returnees, they are called the returnees who were deported or were sent from other places. They are racially segregated by the PRC Chinese, so because they look different. Uh, right? So in these places, uh, many of the people uh, from India that uh, I spoke to, they would say they would not get jobs because they look different. Uh, and that's another reason why they try to have this nostalgia for India continue because that has become their identity. They have not integrated with the Chinese society. Many of them did not speak Mandarin. Uh, they sp still speak uh, Cantonese. Uh, and, and so for, for that part, I mean, they are returnees, but they live a very different life. Uh, and, and they feel that they are uh, not accepted. Uh, by the Chinese. Uh, so it's, it's a fascinating story about uh, these different groups of people living in different places, uh, and it's our mistake to just brand them as Chinese. I don't know if that has any effect. Uh, um, well, I, I claim to be from Xinjiang. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that's better than being an Indian uh, in, in China now, uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, so, so I'll tell you before marriage, not not, not marriage. I think since I lived in China in the 80s uh, uh, as a teenager, uh, we could see the discrimination uh, between how the Chinese treated white people and colored people. Uh, as you know, in, in 89, there was a major uh, 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 rally by the African students in, in China uh, because they were discriminated by the Chinese. Uh, so the place where I studied um, uh, used to have a separate building for African students. And one day they got letters, everybody in that building got a letter saying that you come from jungles, go back to jungles, don't touch our woman. Uh, and uh, one African student was beat, beaten up and that started in Nanjing, uh, uh, this protest by the African students. Um, uh, Indians uh, also, I mean, not at that level, but uh, still, yeah. This has more to do with present day now. Uh, in the last four or five years, uh, there has been a marked uh, enhanced interest on the part of the uh, Chinese consulate in Calcutta to step up activities in this region, uh, particularly uh, in the educational and the cultural field. There have been a lot of exchange programs organized from schools here and even principals of several schools being taken to China to different cities and so on and hosted over there uh, and also making documentary films on Indo-Chinese relations. There is a short documentary film made on the uh, Acu Pressure Society which exists here and apparently there is a listeners club of uh, Chinese radio near Nandigram, where people have been listening to China, Radio China for 30 years, and these people have been taken to China now. And uh, there was another effort of Bengali businessmen who have been very successful in Shanghai, and there has been a documentary film made on them. And there is also a proposal to make a film on uh, marriages between Chinese and Indian, if one is <laughs> available on that. And all this initiative has been taken by the Chinese consulate in India. I don't know whether there is any representative of the Chinese consulate present here, uh, but uh, uh, I'm curious as to why this enhanced sudden interest, particularly in this part of the country. On, on the part of the Chinese. Actually, we have two people who are engaged from the Indian side. Uh, Ms. He here, uh, yeah, from, uh, she is an, uh, one of the exchange students between Yunnan and Jadapur University. Raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, she is doing uh, her uh, PhD in comparative literature. And is Manjusha still there? No, Manjusha left, is it? Uh, she she also works for the Indian schools and takes the principals uh, to to uh, to China. Um, why the interest? Um, I think it's a selfish interest. Um, one belt, one road uh, interest. Uh, and uh, and I think uh, uh, the reason has been uh, for especially Yunnan um, the access to Indian Ocean and uh, Burma and and 
and Bengal are the places where they can get access to the Indian Ocean. But it started before uh, the One Belt, One Road initiative. Uh, they have, uh, Hari has been involved in something called K2K, Kunming to Kolkata initiative. Um, and so it's, it's I, I would not say it's just one directional. It started, um, and, and I think Chinese do much better work than us, right? Um, Momota couldn't visit China, unfortunately, for some reason. Um, but uh, it, it, yes, they have been pushing for it, and they have been patient about it. And I think many of these things are good. Uh, to, to promote uh, these kinds of linkages. It's good for us. I think many of the principals who go to, uh, to China or the schools that have Chinese uh, should learn uh, uh, Chinese uh, now. There are business opportunities. Uh, promotion of, I've always felt, and this is what I think K2K was trying to do, is to promote the understanding of this part of the world among the Chinese. As you know, perhaps, that there are very few visitors from China who come to, to India. Uh, compared to the tourists going to to uh, from India to China, um, and and if the consulate uh, is able to do that, uh, it'll be good. Uh, it, there may be self-interest in there, but it's good to have these kinds of interactions. I'm happy that Jadavpur has a student from China who's doing um, PhD here. There should be more of that. Um, it, the, the, the other side is problematic. What the Indian government is not doing, I think, uh, is, is not engaging with that. I mean, uh, Indian government um, is opposed to the Belt and Road Initiative for, for perhaps valid reasons, uh, but it should at least give the states in the East and Northeast a chance to cooperate with various Chinese states. We are still in the 1960s mode. We are afraid of what the Chinese are trying to do. Uh, it's high time, I, mean, I think Hari can speak more about this. Um, many of the northeastern states could actually benefit from exchanges and interactions and businesses with the Chinese states. Uh, and I think, um, uh, I think if our, uh, I don't know when the consulate in, in Chongqing, uh, is it Kunming or Chongqing that's supposed to be open, opens our, our embassy. So when I went to these communities in, in Canton, these returnees communities, I suggested to the, the current ambassador, Gautam Bambewala, who was then the consulate general in, in Canton, is to take these people back to Assam and Kolkata. They are so much in love with, 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 uh, with India, even though the Indian government deported them. They would like to come back and see the old places, right? And bring them for seven days and show them around. When a Chinese government does that, takes all these people on full, uh, full uh, hotel and, and other lodging and things, um, we should bring these people here. I mean, so I think our embassy, our consulate uh, in China should equally engage with the people and not just maintain the Indian diasporic community. And that's what the Indian consulate and embassy does in, in China, is to bring everybody for the Independence Day celebration Indians. But they have to engage with the, with the Chinese as the consulate here does. So it was an advertisement for the Chinese consulate, sorry. <laughs> in the early 1965, I remember in, at Eden Garden, there was one particular tree, and the Chinese community used to regularly come there. I don't know, every day or a pa some particular day, and they used to put vermin on there. And they used to stay there for quite a lo long time and worship the tree. I would like I to know, that's fascinating. Yes, that I remember. Uh -huh. Before the pagoda was done. Is there still a tree still there? Pardon? That I don't know because okay. Indian Garden is out of reach for people now. Uh -huh. Unless you play cricket. There's a timing, odd timing, from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. I don't know who will visit that Indian Garden from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. Sheet kala And then I had a friend, Uchan Tham. He wanted to stay back in India. He had one restaurant under this thing, Fatnani Chambers, uh, Eros by name. Till last, he wanted to stay back. But after the Chinese aggression and especially after the Naxalite movement, there was problem and we were regular. He used to come to my place and I used to go to his place at Chadni Chok. There was some pressure and regular these officials used to come and show them guns and get free fooding because it was a restaurant and he used to complain to me this is the situation and I don't think I'll be putting up for a long and I have to go back and he was my childhood friend and this is I wanted to share 
with everyone. I think those kinds of stories are important. How you engage with, uh, with the Chinese community members uh, would be fascinating from our side. I don't think anybody has compiled stories about uh, how we engaged with the Chinese in Kolkata. Maybe you can do it part of our heritage. Yeah, friends, as I yeah. So, yeah, we are engaging with them. We're trying to get these stories. In fact, there was this uh, gentleman who came from the US and uh, there, there was a film made, I think you may have seen that, on uh, the uh, deportation or the internment and all that, how they, they related their stories. Not the legend of Fat Mama. No, that does not have so much. Uh, the they have the Canadian, they have the Toronto part in there. Okay. Yeah. Well, but I this is the Taiwanese well, one. Uh, no, this is a legend of, uh, that is by Elias. Elias, yeah. No, no, this is yeah. not that one. Barbed wire, yeah. M maybe it's barbed wire, yeah. maybe that one, yeah. Uh, I have two questions actually. The first is, um, in fact, uh, a couple of weeks back I was in Yunnan province and I heard of a community which celebrates Holi every year, playing not with colors but just with water. Not in Yunnan, but I couldn't get geographically where it's that is. Sichuan Panna. Okay. Is that the community which you are referring to? No, this is uh, not every Holi is a Holi. Um, it's it's a different tradition uh, in in Sichuan Panna. Uh, I think uh, it has nothing to do with uh, the celebrations we have. Uh, it's a, it's a water only thing, um, and it's uh, near uh, Thailand actually. Uh, and uh, so um, yeah, it's, it's it's a tradition that seems to have developed there. Uh, there, and the second question. Hello. The second uh, is um, has to do with uh, the number of Indian students I found in uh, university, you know, as remote as Dali. I mean, not even in Kunming. I mean, there were two hundred odd Indian students there. So, in your own university, do you see the number of uh, Indian students growing? Um, there are twenty thousand Indian students in China. Uh, they are learning medicine. Uh, and a degree that is not recognized by the Indian government. Uh, they come back. Uh, this is a very peculiar uh, group of people. They don't engage with the Chinese as they should be. Their whole training is in English. Uh, with uh, universities and, and colleges that are not of first year, not even second year. Um, and I think it's a Saraswati something that advertises uh, for, for this. They have to come back and take an exam and then uh, practice. This is similar to what happened with Soviet Union when many of the students were going to Soviet Union to study medicine. Um, but that no longer exists. China has become a business. Um, NYU Shanghai is uh, a different institution. Uh, it's a U.S. institution, um, and, and there are applications from all over the world. 50% of the students are Chinese, and uh, other are from different parts of the world. Unfortunately, there's not a single Indian student. Um, there are many Pakistanis, um, and for this reason, we are doing an outreach to the Indians in Delhi uh, next week uh, to see uh, if people would be interested in uh, in coming to NYU Shanghai. There are lots of Indians who go, go to NYU Abu Dhabi, uh, uh, but not NYU Shanghai. Um, but, you know, but this is not an easy institution to get into. Um, you have to go through all this usual US uh, application process. Um, but we hope, yes, there will be more applicants uh, from India to NYU Shanghai. No, so that's um, so we are sometimes Chinese, sometimes uh, U.S. We take our uh, cue whenever it's needed. So uh, the consulate thinks we are a U.S. institution, uh, and and that's why we are. So you in 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 the in China there are a number of in foreign universities who have opened their campuses. Nottingham has one. Uh, Duke is starting one. Um, but uh, they have to partner with Chinese universities, and, and we have a partner. Um, but no, uh, we did not. We'll do it independently. We, we assert our independence. Interested in applying, is it? <laughs> Maybe a bit late in the day. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I wonder if you can share more lights on this particular guy. I mean, I asked people, uh, local Hakanese here, and obviously a lot of friends didn't know about this guy. I mean, 
this important event, and he was, well, according to the sources, I, I know he was actually caught here, right? In the prison here. I mean, in, in Fort Williams, right? Yeah. And, yeah, so that would be, maybe you could share us more about this particular. And the second thing is about Renshi, I mean, the cemetery of, of military, I mean, soldiers. Uh, yeah, anything you, Renshi. But the largest one is Renji, right? I mean, the one caused us, well, some controversies in a couple of weeks ago, right? Uh, I mean, that, that particular place is, reminds us, I mean, or uh, reminds me, uh, some of the military activities here in Calcutta. I mean, that also a lot of, you know, military, I mean, um, activities. I mean, a uh, long time ago, I mean, historical backgrounds, but also might have some uh, current influence. It's a military activity of the good kind. Um, so the first one, Ye ming Shin was uh, the governor of uh, two provinces, uh, Guangxi and Guangdong. Uh, he was uh, arrested by the British uh, for opposing the British and, and taken to Kolkata. I, I was talking about the prisoner. He was one of the leading uh, prisoners who was brought uh, in the 19th century uh, to, to Kolkata and he died here. So the person who actually brought uh, him to Kolkata wrote uh, one of the earliest uh, on the Chinese community here, Alabastra. Uh, and so his English writing is, is available. We do not know much about what happened uh, to Ye when, when he was in Kolkata. Uh, we know that he died here. The treatment he received uh, in Fort Williams, we don't know if, if there are some archival things we can look up. Do you know anything? Yeah, yeah, You need a permission. You need to take a permission. If somebody from Fort William invites you, you can go around. And you mean the military invites me? <laughs> I don't know. It will be for a good reason or a bad one. Um, but the, 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 the cemetery one is, is quite fascinating. This has to do with the Second World War. Uh, when, the, uh, when the Chinese uh, were stationed in uh, and around Kolkata, getting trained by the British and the African American forces uh, to fight the Japanese. Uh, so many of them came here. The problem was that uh, after the war ended, many of them didn't want to go back. Uh, and the British were trying to drive them out. So in the British archives, there are these records about how to get rid of the Chinese who don't want to go, because you know, after the war ended, there was a civil war in China. Uh, it's so so uh, many of them didn't want to go back. And in fact, later on, uh, the PRC government uh, perceived them as coming tongue soldiers and didn't want to recognize them. It's only recently in the last 10, 15 years that they have started writing about uh, these soldiers who were stationed in Burma and, 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 uh, and India. Uh, but those who died were buried in three cemeteries. One is in Ramgar, uh, one is near Ledo, uh, and the other, I think, is somewhere in Nefa or Arunachal Pradesh. Um, the controversial one was the Ramgar, because now both uh, Taiwan and PRC claim that. Right? Uh, and, and so that has become a political issue uh, between the PRC and, and Taiwan. The upkeeping went on by the, by the Taiwanese for a long time. Right. I think... Uh well, I think this has been a, a wonderful interaction, and uh, um, I'm certain that most, uh, that all of you have enjoyed what Tansen has been talking about. And uh, in future, there'll be more questions that you have, and he comes and goes from Calcutta, so there'll be other occasions during which uh, you can pose them. Um, I'd just like to end by uh, pointing out two things. I think one or two of the um, the simple issues that rise from the conversation is there's a lot of interest in in the recent connections over the 20th century and up to today uh, with China and, and a little less um, concerning uh, the earlier um, connections of the 19th century except that I think a rather delicious story of the of the general who was uh, was interned here. Um, it is very strange uh, that in a city which prided itself on um, on left-wing uh, activities, engagements, um, that uh, the communist movement does not seem to have linked with the 
groups within the Chinese community who proclaim themselves to be communists, uh, there seems somewhere um, to be a lack of connect which is not really explicable. I mean, since in fact, in a way, there was uh, a potential channel for all sorts of ideas and such to move between China and, and Calcutta then and into, uh, say, a larger Indian body of thought, it doesn't seem to have happened. Um, I mean, I, I'm just curious as to why it didn't happen and whether anybody tried to make it happen. That's something one to think about. Um, the, uh, the second point actually is, is more an answer to, to something that you, um, that you raised, uh, Raman, which is regarding the, the, this educational um, explosion. Because um, at the end of the expo that took place here a couple of months ago, um, the, uh, the consulate actually congratulated itself very much on the fact that Chinese education has arrived. And uh, if you had actually attended the, the expo, you would see why uh, they congratulated themselves on it. Because the number of people who were interested were enormous. And it was very clear that many of them were going to follow up on, um, on what, was, what was on display. Uh, and I think here there, there are two dimensions which we may as well bear in mind, including the one that Tan Sen represents, um, which is a third one. Um, which is the uh, the nature of Chinese education? Which is that there was a I think there's been a time when um, within the PRC there's an increasing awareness that in order to follow up on China's globalization, it's important to pr to produce people who are capable of engaging with the world on a very large scale. So in fact, actually, the university as a space suddenly developed in terms of numbers, in terms of facilities, almost everywhere. And the number of private universities has developed enormously. But in order to sustain themselves, and in order really to engage even further with the task which they've set themselves, they have decided to go abroad. And they've decided to bring students in, and they've decided to earn. And this earning process, I think, is very important. And many of them actually from the southwestern region uh, really go to Laos, to Vietnam, to, uh, to Thailand, etc. In order to try and promote the inrush of students. They want students to go. And they understand somewhere the Chinese business is on the up. So students want to know Chinese. So I think that's one level from their point of view. The other level from our point of view is the phenomenon that Tan Sen was pointing out, which is really, they are really renting space. So they provide space for Indians to go to China to teach Indians medicine or engineering, whatever it is, and then to teach those same Indians how to pass the exam in order to be recognized in India, simply because you cannot get a, a job, a, a place in an engineering college, or you cannot get a job, a place in a medical college in India. So they merely rent the building, and that's a good way of earning and a good way of improving your stuff as well. The important thing is the third level, which really his university represents, which is there's a lot of value addition to their own system that they're doing, which is by inviting different universities to set up shop in China. So it's a it's a move it's a it's a system in in, in uh, on the move. And it's not always central government controlled or regional government No, Once you actually set it in motion, it begins to achieve a certain dynamic of its own. So, what we are seeing, and if you get on the China Eastern flights, you'll occasionally see a small bunch of students, all of who have basic Chinese, etc., who come and go. It's, it's part of that particular phenomenon. That would be the, the answer to, to what you were saying. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, do you wish to add? Uh, yes. I, I think uh, there are some anthropologists sitting there. Uh, in fact, the study of these traders and trading between Kunming and, and, and Kolkata uh, is a fascinating topic. And, and they trade in very small things. Perhaps they don't make a lot of money. So it, uh, I don't recommend traveling by this channel. <laughs>
because you'll be given a suitcase and say, can you carry this suitcase for me for 10,000 rupees? Please don't do that. Um, but one thing that Harry pointed out, and I, I, I think we should emphasize this, uh, sadly, there's not a single permanent position on Chinese studies or Chinese language in Kolkata. Uh, and, and so all this engagement with China uh, has not created anything uh, that we can be proud of. Um, I, I think Bonali is sitting there and she has been looking for a job in, in Kolkata uh, and uh, Calcutta University where Chinese studies started. Actually Fort Williams was one of the places that was engaged in the first translation of Bible uh, into Chinese uh, and Kolkata University was, was, the, was the first place where Chinese studies started, Chinese language teaching started. Uh, after 62, uh, the Chinese or the Indian government thought it's better not to do anything with China, including not learn anything Chinese. Uh, that was so terrible. Uh, I point out what happened when Sputnik was sent by the by the Russians, by the Soviet Union. Uh, USA started this, uh, something called the FLAS, Foreign Language and Area Studies Fellowship, in order to understand foreign countries. So many of us were funded by this this money. The Indian government <coughs> totally reversed, so they stopped anything to do with China. Uh, Shantaniket and China Bhavan declined, uh, Calcutta University declined, all these institutions uh, that were doing China studies ended. What fl flourished after that was a CIA funded uh, Institute of Chinese Studies, which still exists in Delhi. Uh, and and some of the, so so you can see how we, we dealt with China uh, in, a, in, a, in a perhaps a negative way, where we should have studied China, our close neighbor perhaps, our uh, who said that uh, our first enemy is China, um, we should have learned about them, but sadly we have not done so, and Calcutta especially uh, is way behind uh, in, in China studies, uh, unfortunately. I think we should end with that pessimistic yes. note. Um, <laughs> without a few. <laughs> yeah, th thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, even though you say you end on a pessimistic note, uh, let us Give our speaker a big hand, please, for all the interesting information that he has shared with us. And for the chairperson who has also supplemented the information and uh, given us more information on that count. Uh, before we discuss, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, all of you, for being here. There is a little pleasant task we have to perform. A little memento on behalf of uh, Victoria Memorial, which we would like to hand over to Professors Tansin Sen and Ali Vasudevan as joined us and Gupta is busy on the telephone. Uh, is he coming? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I thought he has taken the flight out to China. I saw Xi Jinping on his desk. Join those pleasant tasks to be performed yet. 16 August to 17. <laughs> Okay, ladies and gentlemen, on your way out here, right at the back, there's some tea and momos waiting. <laughs>